If you want to learn how to make Ghibli style textures in Substance Painter, the latest course from the 3D coloring book was made for you. This beginner friendly course will show you just how easy it is to make drag and drop anime style smart materials that you can use in any project. I'll leave a link in the description if you want to consider getting the course. Now let's get into this week's video. Hello everybody! My name is Natalia and in this video I will show you how I made this Cat Knight character. I will talk about my process of making a stylized 3D model and textures and I will share some tips and tricks with you as well. Software I use for this project are Blender, ZBrush and Substance Painter. And for presenting my work I used Sketchfab. First and foremost, I would like to give credit to Andrei Modestov who made this awesome illustration that inspired me to model this cat. Speaking about inspiration, I believe that you should work from concept that you personally like, whether it's your own idea or somebody else's. When you choose concepts and references for your project, you should also keep in mind what you want to learn during the process. In other words, your project should be both a fun and challenging experience for you. Take me for example, I absolutely love this illustration, because I like animals and fantasy setting, and I wanted to practice hand-painted textures like metals and fabrics. You may be interested in spaceships and weapons, or you may want to learn anatomy. Just choose what inspires you the most. Once you have found the concept, you should analyze it. Make sure you understand as much as you can about the design of whatever it is you're going to create. Let's have a look at this cat. Cute, isn't he? But what makes him cute? It could be those round, soft shapes that make him appear friendly. See? Even the tip of his sword isn't very sharp. He also has big eyes, and we know that big eyes mean cute. His armor looks a bit too big on him, that is both funny and adorable. Also, don't forget about storytelling. The scratches on his sword and shield tell us that he fought in a battle or a duel before. And look at his pose. He lifts up his sword as if he was ready to take on another challenge. So take a while to notice any significant design elements. It is very important that you have a clear idea of the shape language and proportions when you're about to make a stylized character. Now we know what we're doing. The next step in my process is planning out all the things to do. I break down the project into phases and then phases into small tasks. In this particular case, the phases were blocking out, retopology, UVs, texturing, and presentation. Remember to allow for some flexibility during the project, as you can't predict everything, especially if you are a beginner. As far as personal projects are concerned, you shouldn't stress too much about deadlines. However, it could be useful to take notes of the time you spend on each task and see how fast and productive you are in specific areas of your process. In my case, I have finished the project in about 30 hours and I spend the majority of my time on textures. Let's jump into phase one, blocking out. At the very beginning, don't think too much about the details. Just focus on getting the big shapes and proportions correctly. You can take some liberties and stray a bit from the concept because 2D art doesn't always translate well into 3D. Keep in mind that you don't necessarily have to stay 100% faithful to the concept when it doesn't look so great. Use your own artistic mind to decide what looks better. If you find yourself overwhelmed by the scope of your project at the beginning, I'm sure we all feel this way at some point, try doing the thing that looks the least complicated to you. This way you will warm yourself up for more difficult things. For blocking out the cat, I used both Blender and ZBrush. There are some things I am more comfortable doing in Blender like hard surface elements. And I am much faster at sketching organic shapes in ZBrush. I used ZBrush to quickly sketch the main shapes and proportions of the cat. 
I didn't worry about topology and how many polygons I had, because I knew I was going to retopologize it anyway. I might have gone a bit too far with the details in some places, but at that point I wasn't sure if I needed to bake a normal map. I used some of the most basic brushes you can find in ZBrush, such as Standard, Move, Pinch and Smooth. I dynameshed some spheres to sculpt the head, the body, gloves and the fluffy thing on his head. The other parts, like arms, belt and claws, are cylinders and planes. And that's it. Sometimes you just don't need all the fancy features of your software to get the job done. With this 3D sketch finished, I moved on to Blender to refine some shapes and model hard surface objects. Time for Blender tip number one. Let me show you a non-destructive way to bend surfaces in Blender. To give the shield its slightly curved shape, we will use a lattice modifier. Select the object you want to deform, apply scale first by Ctrl A just in case. Go to the Modifiers tab and select Lattice from the drop down menu. And nothing happens. That's because we don't have a lattice object to deform with. Shift A to add a new object and choose Lattice. Position and scale the lattice so that your object can fit inside of it. Then assign this lattice object to your modifier. To make use of the lattice, go into edit mode and manipulate the vertices however you want. You can still go into edit mode of your deformed object and see that it's nice and straight. This way it can be easier for you to add more details on top of it. When you're happy with the deformations, simply apply the modifier and you can get rid of the lattice object. Right away, tip number two. How to cut holes into mesh. There is an add-on for Blender called Bull Tool. And don't worry, you don't have to download anything from anywhere. You can enable this add-on by going to Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, type in Bool, B-O-O-L, and tick the box. Press N to show the panel on the right, and under the Edit tab, you should see the Bool Tool menu. Here I have a top piece of the helmet, and I will cut some holes into it using this piece of geometry and Bool Tool. Place the shape where you want the hole to be. Make sure it intersects with the other mesh. Select this mesh first, then the object you're cutting into, and choose Brush Boolean Difference. Now there is a hole in the mesh, the other object disappeared, but now we can see this wireframe cube. If you move it around, it will update this Boolean function on the fly. Not only can you move and scale this object, but also you can go into edit mode and duplicate it, change shape or add new shapes as well. Pretty handy, right? Once you're happy with the result, click apply brush. Then you should go and clean up the geometry because Boolean operation often create angles and we don't want any angles in our clean topology. For retopology, I tend to use the combination of shrink wrap modifier and snapping. I do most of my retopo by hand, unless I have very little time, or when the object doesn't need to be rigging friendly. There are tools like QuadriMesh in Blender or ZRemesher in ZBrush that will do the work for you, but since I had a lot of time, I decided to work on retopology just for the sake of practicing. Okay. 
Let's take the cat's face, for example. And this is tip number three, by the way. First, disable the selectable option in the outliner so you don't accidentally move the object during retopo. Then add a plane and place it near to the object's surface. Go to the Modifiers tab and choose Shrink Wrap. Pick your target object, in this case the face, and you can leave the rest of the settings as they are. You can see that something is already happening, but we need one more thing. Turn on Snapping with Snap to Face selected. Now in Edit mode, you can move the vertices and extrude polygons, and they will snap to the surface of your model. You can also add a mirror modifier. Just be mindful of the origin point. Make sure that your polygons are evenly distributed and have a nice edge flow. When Retopo was finished, I moved on to UVing the character. I know this isn't everybody's favorite part of the process, but if I can do it, you can do it too. Try to minimize the stretching and have as few seams as possible. Also, if your model is going to be seen from all angles, you should be mindful of your texel density. To see if you have consistent texel density, you can plug in a new texture to a material, and select Color Grid or UV Grid, whichever you prefer. You should now see the grid on the mesh. The more even it appears on an object, the better. Scale the islands to balance your texel density and look out for stretching. There is another way to see if your UVs are stretched. Go to the UV editor and from the menu on the right side, go to View, Overlays and tick the box by the stretching option. Blue color is good. That means the texture will show perfectly on the model. If you see the color change to light blue or green, that means there is going to be a little bit of stretching. It won't look very bad on organic models though. Orange or red means that you have very bad stretching going on and you should definitely fix it. Organize your UV islands so that you don't waste a lot of space on your texture. After I packed my UVs, it was about time to go to Substance Painter and paint some textures. It's important that you have enough reference for the materials you're about to paint. You can gather real-life reference photos as well as other artists' stylized take on materials. Observe them carefully. If you are going to paint only base color texture, you have to notice how reflective the materials are, notice any important details like holes, dirt, cloth folds. You will have to exaggerate these qualities to make them look more stylized. You can leave out the smallest surface details as they can break the stylization. For my cat, I ended up with a 2K texture with only base color channel. In Substance Painter, you can always change the resolution, add or remove channels if you need. I begin with baking, in case I want to use generators, and this time I also needed an ambient occlusion map. I check the box, use low poly as high poly mesh, and uncheck the normal and ID map. Since I don't need the lighting information, I also switch the display mode from material to base color. 
To help me see the form of an unlit mesh, I plug the AO map to a fill layer set to multiply and keep it always on the top of the layer stack. I used the light generator on a fill layer with a black mask to have some lighting already on the model. It's a nice little touch to have at the beginning and you can always disable it later if you no longer need it. I use fill layers with masks to assign flat colors to objects. I start from quite dark colors and then gradually paint lighter tones on top of them and darker tones if needed. I have multiple layers for shading and details for each part of the cat, but of course you can have fewer if you feel very confident in painting. I paint it with a combination of soft, hard and texture brushes throughout the texturing process. I experimented a lot and it took me quite a few attempts to get to the point when I was happy with what I drew. It was a learning experience for sure. So don't get discouraged if you can't do something on the first try. Take a break if you feel frustrated and return to work with a calm mind. You can overcome any obstacles with patience and positive attitude. After all, challenges are good for your growth as an artist. Don't give up too easily. Finally, I exported the textures and the mesh to Sketchfab. Alternatively, I could render some pictures, but since this guy doesn't require light, I find it unnecessary. In Sketchfab, I can present my work in real time, and that's perfect for me. You can try it out yourself, it's free. When the model has uploaded, I set the shading to unlit, assign textures, and pick a nice background color. It's a very simple setup. I double-checked if everything displayed properly. I know I can always re-upload my project in case I find errors, such as normals facing the wrong directions, and so on. And last but not least, my favorite part, post-processing filters. They can make your model look even better. I usually enable all of them one by one and keep the ones that have the best effect on my scene. You can do some color correction, use vignette to bring focus to your piece, add some chromatic aberrations, and many more. And then I publish my work for others to see. Don't be afraid to share your art with the world. You may get critiques, useful advice, and some appreciation, which is always nice. Who knows, maybe you will make friends with other artists as well.
And that is all from me. Thank you so much for watching this video. I am very grateful for this opportunity to share my process with you. Take care. Bye bye.